everyone. This is a special podcast episode of the Fancy Scientist podcast. This episode is taken from my group, the Successful Wildlife Professional. And we do these series called VP Connect, where we discuss with a topic and network with each other just to learn from each other and get to know each other. This topic was on the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I wanted to take portions of this podcast and share it with you because this book Atomic Habits is amazing and it was so helpful in my life and I highly recommend it. So I really think that you guys can benefit from listening to this discussion and some parts will be edited out where where members of the program talk. So if there are parts that are not completely consistent, that's that's why, but you'll understand everything you need to know about the book and the main takeaways. That's what I was looking for takeaways from this book that you can really implement in your life. So have fun listening and I hope you enjoy it. Atomic Habits. I first heard of it on entrepreneurial podcasts and I think just like self-development podcasts as well. And I remember, I think it was one of my blogging ones. They were interviewing the person and they highly recommended it, but I was like, oh, like I know a lot about habits. I read the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People or something like that it was a famous book that came out a couple of years ago. And I just didn't think that there would be much that I would learn from it, honestly. So I didn't pay any attention to it. But I kept on hearing about this book. And then somebody I really look up to and was reading the book and she was taking screenshots of it and putting it in her stories and she had a Kindle. So she was like highlighting the areas that she liked. And then I was like, oh, this is not just a habit book because the part that she highlighted was about identity change. And the reason why I think I was so opposed to reading this book in the first place was because I have learned that, and this is a big concept in the book, that to make true changes, they're not effective when you work on it from like an environmental or outcome level. Something that I talk about in the mindset course is this pyramid based on this model of change. Basically, what a lot of people do is work on these outside things. So I'll probably use weight loss a lot as an example, just because it's really easy to understand. It's really tangible. There's like definite things you can do to become healthier, or we can say like fit. And a lot of people choose it for New Year's resolutions, but a lot of people will like focus on the how and like the what they'll do. Oh, if I do X, Y, Z, then I'll lose X pounds a week. And then by June, I'll look like this, or I'll be this weight. But you're not changing yourself. You're just changing the things that you do. And that's what I thought this habit book would be like. And that's why I avoided it. But in the beginning few chapters are really the most valuable, honestly. And he talks about the importance of identity. So you want to work from the inside out. So if you want to become a healthier person or really fit or lose weight, then you have to change how you think about yourself that, or that's going to be the most effective way. So having an identity that you can believe in. So like having the identity of an athlete or just somebody who exercises every day, that's pretty much my identity. Now I definitely don't consider myself an athlete, but I consider myself someone who exercises pretty much every day. I usually take one day off a week, but if it's more than that, I get and it just doesn't feel good. So he says, and I took a bunch of notes here and I think they're like, they might be like a little bit all over the place as I go over them, but the most effective way is to do it at the identity level. So not the outcome or the process level, although those are important. And the reason why is it motivates you to maintain the habits that are associated with it. And it's a source of true behavior change with your identity. There's certain identities 
you want to be associated with and other ones you won't. Like a good example of this is smoking. If I were to ask you if you wanted a cigarette, and your answer probably would really either strongly be yes or no. And if I asked you why, you'd be like, well, I'm a smoker. If you said yes, or I'm not a smoker, it's not something you really need to think about it. And that's partly because of the identity level. And yes, there is obviously addiction and some physiological effects too, but all these habits, they really do, no matter what, they have some physiological imprint because you're doing it over and over again. If you embody yourself a certain way at the identity level, then certain habits or certain ways of doing things are not going to be consistent with that. So if you want to become a fit person, eating certain things in large quantities are not going to align with that. So if you, if you change that one thing, if you change how you view yourself, then, then you can change the habits more easily. And the more evidence that you have for this belief, the more strongly that you will believe it. When you're starting a fitness journey, you're not going to have that much evidence for it. It's going to be tough. And he gives some tips for starting habits and stuff. But for me, like now, like if I were to say, like, I'm a fit person, like I see that now because... Several months ago, I wasn't exercising as much and I had some back issues and things like that. And I've seen myself get stronger. So I have evidence now and now it's, oh yeah, I believe I'm like a fit person. So they're combined. But again, if you can start at the identity level and so he talks about, think about systems and not goals. So if you can think about the type of person that you want to be, like you for most of us, we don't really want to be a reader or sorry, we don't really want to have read one book. We want to be well-read or a reader. That's how I feel. Like, yes, there's certain books I want to read, but in general, I want to be a reader. That's a habit I struggle with a lot. So he says to think about systems and not goals. And the reason why that is because goals are for a moment. So goals, like they tell you to do like smart goals. So you want to choose something that's like within the realm of what you can do, but stretches you. There's a time frame on it. It's measurable. So again, if you wanted to lose weight, saying you wanted to lose weight, well, if you lost one pound, that's losing weight. Or if you wanted to invest your money, investing one cent is technically investing your money. So you got to choose something specific and measurable. But the problem with goals, and it's okay to have goals, but the problem with goals is like your happiness or your satisfaction is very much associated with achieving the goal. So I would do these three-month planners where I would have a goal at the end and I would either achieve it or I didn't achieve it. And not achieving it doesn't feel good. But if you do achieve it, it does feel good but you only feel that way for a temporary amount. So if I were to get my first paper publication, it feels good, but it feels good for maybe, I don't know, a day, a week maybe. And then after that, you kind of get used to things. So I really loved about this is that he says to focus in on systems and not goals. Like you can have goals and work towards them, but don't let goals dictate your happiness. And when you fall in love with the process rather than the results or the product, then you don't wait to have to give yourself permission to be happy. So like with the paper thing, not just being happy when you submit a paper or when you get a paper published, being happy with the fact that you have a system, an efficient system to write papers or that you are a paper writer or that you're a scientist. And that's something that I wish I had learned a long time ago. And like, just really think about things in that framework. How can I develop an efficient system out of this? And I even thought about that in the specific examples with my papers and thought about creating something to share it with people because it is kind of formulaic when you get down to it. Like the same thing with the cover letters. It's like you have your intro paragraph, then you have like your paragraph stating the main theme one, then main theme two, then main three and three. And then depending on how many main themes there are, and then your conclusion, like there's a certain system and there's certain elements that go into it to focus on the system. And I love that too, because I think we're really harsh on ourselves and by 
prolonging the happiness. We're not letting ourselves be happy when, when, until we get that result. So with the systems, it's something you can like celebrate or be proud of yourself every day. That makes, that takes a lot of practice. So like you have to actively work on celebrating and being proud of yourself. That's something that I still struggle with. Going back to the beginning of the book, something that he really emphasizes is that and this is another mistake that people make is, especially like with New Year's, which is coming up, they will make these gigantic habit changes. Like with fitness, I am going to exercise every day. I am going to eat clean. I'm going to stop eating three hours before bedtime, whatever. And it's so much that it's like too much change for us all at once. And you just end up throwing everything out. But he talks about how tiny changes are really what makes a big difference. And he talks about, there was, he gives a couple examples, but there was one like sports team where they just tried, the coach just tried to get them to be 1% better every day. And like every day they would learn something new to make themselves 1% better. But even to think of yourself in that way, like how can, like I'm getting 1% better today. Like just thinking that mentally. Or what can I do to become 1% better? It's such like a tiny amount. So it's not a lot of pressure on you, but, but it's something that if, you know, if you do it 30 days, you're 30% better. And if you do it in a hundred days, you're a hundred percent better. And then he talks about pounding too, that good habits, all habits compound and that change is not linear. And he gives the example of ice, which I really like is that you can have a change in the temperature with ice up to 32 degrees and nothing happens. It's just ice. But then once it's, once it reaches 32 degrees, it melts and that's when the change happens. So for some of these habits or for, and for some of the outcomes, it takes time to build them up and then it all kind of happens at once. And that definitely can happen with weight loss. I've, I've actually been feeling that way. I've been working on exercising and getting more fit and I wasn't seeing any results, but now I'm starting to, and now it's starting to come faster and I'm noticing things faster. Same thing like with your career or with like social media, especially if you do like social media for your career, it's almost like exponential. Like you do nothing, you don't do that well for a very long time. And then like people catch on and then it grows and grows. So, and then most people fail at their habits that they want to create because they don't see a tangible result. So again, focusing on falling in love with the process, if you fall in love with the process of getting fit, and that's really what I was doing. I was like, oh, my, like, I did start to think about the results, like my back is hurting less, but I also started thinking about, I like the process of doing this, of strengthening myself and letting go of any like weight loss of things like that, because then you're just more likely to give up. And that's what people do. They give up. There's this one graphic of somebody digging. They're looking for gold and it's like a cartoon and, and somebody will be digging underground. It's like zigzagging and then they give up. And then like right before they give up, there's a little bit of gold. So it's kind of that mentality that, that you got to Keep going, even if you don't see, don't do it for the result. Detach yourself from the results. The other thing I really liked about this book is that I personally can be really hard on myself. And like, I'm always like striving to be the most efficient and the like, yeah, the most efficient, accomplished things that I want to accomplish. And I just put in myself. And I thought that reading this book, it would put pressure on me that I would, you know, get that like motivation to do this, but I would also do it in a hard way. Kind of like how I talked about New Year's, oh, I'm going to start all these new habits. And he really advises against that. And he, he talks about how with your habits to think about them being this like tiny little votes for how you want to be. You say you want to write a book, so you're going to embody the identity of a writer. And like throughout your day, you're casting votes that either take you closer to being a writer or farther away. So closer would be, you know, writing, <laughs> like spending the time to write, or even just like having a notebook to keep track of your ideas or something. So like eating healthier or becoming more fit, every decision you make 
is a cast and is it a cast in the direction that is leading you towards where you want to be or away from it's okay if you have casts in the direction that you don't want to be in as long as most of them are where you want them to be as long as most of them are in the the cast in the direction of where you want to be. So it's not about beating yourself up for making a mistake. It's about, okay, I did five things today that weren't really aligned with my identity, but I did six things that were. So it's about casting those votes. And it's just about working on being a little bit better every single day. And then, as I mentioned, the evidence that you have for a belief, the more evidence you have, the stronger you will believe it. So each one of these little votes is evidence. Every time you write a page, that's evidence that you are a writer. Every time you exercise, that is evidence that you are an athlete. So think about it that way. I really loved that part of the book. So just in a nutshell, if you want to change your identity, if you want to adopt new habits, figure out what identity you want to have, and then prove it to yourself with these small wins. So here we're in wildlife work where I'm in wildlife biology, wildlife science. So if I were working on becoming a wildlife biologist, I would choose that identity. So I'm, I want to be a wildlife biologist and prove it to myself. How am I a wildlife biologist? Now say I wasn't working. What could I do to prove myself that I'm a wildlife biologist? I could do citizen science projects. There's citizen science projects online. You can do from the comfort of your own home anytime you want to. And that's a chance for you to be a scientist. You can study your local flora and fauna. You could take a master naturalist class. You could read about species that you want to study one day. You can go to Google Scholar and you can read scientific papers. If you want to be a wildlife biologist and do research, reading scientific papers is definitely going to be lots of votes in that direction. Another thing I just wanted to point out that I loved is habits create freedom. Like I was talking about my resistance to reading this book. And I think part of it was like, oh, like I'm going to have to be rigid and implement these new habits. But habits actually equal freedom. And I first heard this concept about freedom when working with my coach. And she said, schedules equal freedom. And I felt the same thing. I was like a schedule equals freedom. Like I always felt a very attracted in a schedule. I got to finish this by this time. And at this time I got to be doing this. And I felt, yeah, like I was in a box, but when you have things contained, when you have things contained in a box of time and they start and end at a certain time, then when you actually end, you end. So when I don't have a schedule, when things are more whimsical and to my whim, I can do something that would take me 30 minutes. If I put it into this time block, I can stretch it out into three hours with lots of interruptions and not focusing on it completely. And if you do, that, that's totally okay. I do that in my life. I'm not every day um, stuck to a schedule, but just the idea that habits or schedules um, box you in, they actually do create freedom. So I like to associate habits with freedom. How habits work, there are four stages. There's the cue, craving, response, and reward. And the book goes into the details about that. So chocolate is my cue. I eat chocolate after dinner. And now I started, I start to actually crave it after I eat lunch and I think it's because of the cue of eating. So I have the cue of eating and then I have the craving for chocolate. The response is I go get chocolate and then the reward is not the chocolate, 
but it's the feeling the chocolate gives me. It's the pleasure of it being in my mouth. That's the reward of it. And he goes more into detail with this in the book. Creating a good habit involves four layers, making it obvious, making it attractive, easy, and satisfying. And then if you want to break a bad habit, you do the opposite. You make it invisible, you make it unattractive, you make it difficult, and you make it unsatisfying. So attractive. Okay, sorry. So obvious. So obvious is, and some of these are, they can like intermingle with each other, but making it obvious, if you want to exercise, lay out your exercise clothes. Don't have them stuffed in a closet where you don't know where they are. If you want to eat healthy, have healthy food around you. There's studies where people, actually he talks about this in the book, where they want people to cut down on soda and all they did, and they had soda like everywhere in this, it was like an office space or something. And all they did was replace the soda with water and they still had soda, but the water was more easily accessible and more abundant. So that just makes it obvious. Like you're thirsty, you want a drink, you're going to grab what's there. So think about like how you can make your habits so that you don't forget about them. If you want to become a reader, then have your books out. If you want to become a writer, write a note to yourself on your computer or have some sort of prompt, some sort of like post-it note or something. He talks about habit stacking, which I really like. So habit stacking is like when you do one thing, you do another. One thing, so for example, one thing that I have at stack is after I exercise, I stretch and I have a protein shake with it and I usually watch fun TV. So that, that employs a couple of the different habits. So one is making it attractive. I don't really love stretching, but making it attractive by watching fun TV shows when I get to do it. And then also I like my protein shakes too. They're delicious as well. So adding habit stacking onto it to make sure that I stretch. Making it attractive. So I used my TV example. So like maybe you only watch Netflix if you exercise. Also reframing is really important that if you think of, oh, I have to work today or I have to exercise today. Yeah, that's not going to be attractive. You're not going to want to go to work. You're not going to want to exercise. But if you love your work and most of us, well, in this field, a lot of us love our work, but we kind of get caught up with the day to day. So think about what it is that you love about your work. Even if I were working on something like kind of boring, like a boring section of my scientific paper, I can remember like, oh, I'm working on elephants. Like how cool is this? I'm writing a scientific paper on elephants. That's a way that you can reframe. I get to exercise. Some people can't exercise. They're sick. They're bedridden. They have been in an accident and are injured. So I get to exercise. Yeah, it's not always like 100% fun, but if you can't run, like you'd probably be sad. So be excited that you can run. This is something you get to do or associate it with something positive. This is my alone time. This is my quiet time. This is my time to just dedicate to myself. This is my time to build endurance. Those are different ways that you can reframe it. Make it easy. So make it easy to eat healthy if you want to eat healthy. Have lots of healthy foods around you. Get rid of foods that don't make you feel healthy. We talked about reading, have books out. If you want to draw more have or paint more, that's something else I want to do. Have your easel out with your paints out. So it's really easy. You don't have to dig around and look for stuff. If you want to reduce distractions, make it harder for you. Move your phone to a completely different room. There's apps where you can like disable certain social media and stuff like that. The guy in the book talks about how I think he has his personal assistant change his passwords on his social media like every week or something like that. So he minimizes it. So you really want to focus on building the habit and not necessarily, again, the outcome. So he talks about the two minute rule to start building a habit, just focus on two minutes. So if you want to become a reader, read for two minutes and that's it. 
So to put the bar super low, two minutes, and that's it. And achieve it and be done and do that every single day. And then once that habit is established, then you can start adding on to it. You can change it to 15 minutes. And then once 15 minutes is established, you can change it to 30 minutes. So you can see how these build on each other. Oh, and I wanted to talk about the compounding that, let me see. There are some good examples of compounding about negative, positive compounding and negative compounding. Okay. Yeah. Like with negative compounds, negative thoughts compound. The more you think of yourself as worthless, stupid, or ugly, the more you condition yourself to interpret life that way. You get trapped in a thought loop. The same is true for how you think about others. Knowledge compounds, learning, this is a positive one, learning one new idea won't make you a genius, but a commitment to lifelong learning can be transformative. Furthermore, each book you read not only teaches you something new, but also opens up different ways of thinking about old ideas. Warren Buffett says that's how knowledge works. It builds up like a compound interest and make it satisfying. So some ways that you can make it satisfying. Streaks are really helpful. I do Duolingo. I'm learning Portuguese and Duolingo. And I have a streak and I don't want to break that streak. My streak is now like 340 days. They have streak protection. Once you've done so many lessons, you do have a streak protection in case you miss a day. So I haven't actually done 340 days, but I've done enough to compensate for it. But I don't want to lose that streak. I don't want to go back to zero. Same thing with a meditation app that I have. It has a three-day streak because I keep forgetting to do it over the weekend. And I get annoyed when I start over with my streak. So if you can create a calendar where you have a checklist or, or there's apps where you can do that, then that is really helpful. And the key is if you do break a streak to miss one day and get back into it. So just like Duolingo, I never miss more than one day. The faster you can get it back into it, the better. What is immediately rewarded is repeated and what is immediately punished is avoided. So if you can reward yourself for your habits, if you can celebrate, this is something that also solidifies them, that also cements them. So think creatively of like, how can you reward yourself for doing things? Like going back to my protein shake, I actually like really super enjoy them. So going back to my protein shake, it's my reward for exercising. And I kind of feel weird not or eating them when I don't exercise on, on my days off. So that's definitely a habit. And how else can you reward yourself? So sometimes it can be an external reward, working on your finances, and you can just make it so that you always get something delicious when you do your finances or something you really enjoy, like dark chocolate or something like that. That's something I really enjoy and just save that for when you do that. Or it can also be like, again, the reframing, can you intrinsically reframe it? So like, I'm enjoying doing my finances because it makes me feel in control. I know where my money goes. That makes me feel so good. I can relax. I don't need to worry. Things like that. And then finally, one way that you can also work to have your habits stick is through accountability partners. And this works really well for a lot of people. Is there somebody that you can work with if you're going to work out, somebody you're going to meet so that somebody is relying on you? It makes it much more difficult for you not to show up. So again, the book is Atomic Habits by James Clear. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. And I will put in a link for my reading list so you can purchase it if you want to read it. But I highly recommend it. I like it. I bought, I listened to it on Audible and then I also bought the book. Thanks guys. 
I hope you enjoyed this discussion of atomic habits. I love reading books like this, and I really am obsessed with trying to become a more efficient person and just really live my best life. So if you like this episode, I would love if you could shoot me an email or connect with me on social media. I love hearing feedback from you guys. And if you're using atomic habits in your life, I'd love to hear about it too, some ways that you have changed change things in your daily routine to, to make things easier for you, to make your goal come true. If you liked this episode and you want to hear more episodes about books, also let me know. I would love to hear that kind of feedback as well. I'm working on reading more books. I'm not the best at it, although I'm good at listening to books. I have Audible, so I'm good at listening to books. Reading, I tend not to make as much time for it. But if you like this episode and it helps you learn more, just let me know and I'd be happy to create some more episodes like this for you.